welcome. Welcome this morning, everybody. So glad to see you and uh, very thankful to see everybody this morning. Uh, we are going to, as I mentioned, we're going to open Zechariah this morning and start an exploration in that book. But if you are new here or, or have not been to New City before, here's all the information on how you can find us. Our website, newcitychurchokc.org. We have a live stream, so if you're out traveling, newcityokc.online.church. Uh, but there's also a text alert system you can sign up for. There's, so you just text at NCCOKC to 81010 and then our email address. It's pretty simple, newcitychurch.love at gmail.com. We are going to undertake the book of Zechariah next, and we finished Nahum last week, and... This is going to be an, a very interesting book. It's Zechariah is known as the. Uh oh, did I do something, Aaron? Zechariah is known as the the apocalypse of the Old Testament by a lot of people. Actually, um, it's a it's a fascinating book. It's one of the more uh, pertinent books in relation to Jesus uh, from his first arrival all the way through his second arrival, and. As I mentioned, if you are familiar with the word apocalypse, uh, it's from the book of Revelation, so we're going to talk about that in a minute. But Zechariah is, is almost a preamble to the entire book of Revelation, so very fascinating uh, book. And we're going to take it next um, at, the, at the suggestion and confirmation of the, the Holy Spirit and several uh, dear loved ones, so it's, it's going to be fun. But before we open it up, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much again for... This time, God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that what we hold in our hand is the only source of truth in the world, Lord, because Jesus, you said, I am the truth. And God, we thank you that you have preserved it for all of history for us today. God, we thank you that, Lord, by it we can live and have strength. God, we thank you that by your word, we can abide in you in the shadow of the Almighty and stay lockstep with exactly where you are leading us. And so, God, we thank you for this time together. We pray that you'd bless your word. God, let it fall on good soil. Lord, let your word go forth to the ends of the earth and back and not return in vain or in void. Lord, let it fill those gaps all over the planet for a a fresh revival of your spirit all around the globe. Bring people into your kingdom before it's too late, Father. We thank you again for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so as we, as we start off a new book, I just always have to remind everyone of, of who is the teacher. And you know, the Holy Spirit is our teacher as Christians. And you get that from 1 John 2, 27 through 28. It's, it's not me, it's not a spouse or a loved one or another pastor or anyone else. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. And 1 John 2, 27 through 28, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. So that anointing is the Holy Spirit. Remember when Jesus in John 14 said, I must leave so the comforter can come, the Holy Spirit. And then he leaves. And of course, 50 days later on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descends and indwells all the believers but And you need not that any man teach you. So that's not necessarily saying that any man helping you or teaching you is not beneficial. It's that, is it a need or not? And so the, the thing that you have to realize is the need is Jesus. The need is the Holy Spirit to teach you. Now, he will use different people in your life and bring people in and out of your life to help shape that journey. And I, I have a a pretty neat testimony about that myself that maybe I'll share someday here. But in any case, it's not that it's not that pastors or other teachers or commentaries or things like that have no place in your life. The challenge is, are you giving Jesus first and preeminent place to teach and to lead you? And if you are, I promise if you are seeking truth, he will make sure you find it. So let the Holy Spirit teach you and lead you in everything. And it's amazing. I remember a stat I heard at a conference six years ago that of, of this was in 2017, but at that time, and it's probably much worse now, two-thirds of all Christians leave the faith by the time they leave college. 
And part of that problem, part of the problem with that when you dive into the, the research is the church in large part, globally speaking, doesn't give them much of a reason to stay into it. And it gives them uh, feel-good leadership messages or whatever it is, but not teaching the Word of God. And from the book of Amos, uh, there's a famine of the Word of God. And you can find that uh, pretty much globally right now, that there's, there is, are very few and far in between places you can go to just open the Bible. It's amazing. It is, it is the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Word is Jesus uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. And so when you hold this, the book, the Bible in your hand, it is supernatural. It is Jesus literally on the pages, and it became flesh. And he spoke by that Word everything into existence. And so you've got to use that in your life as the guidebook. That is the source of truth. That's what you go back to for everything is the Word. Okay, so for Zechariah, I've showed this a few times here at church, but when you look at an Old Testament timeline from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the end of, of Malachi, the post-exile, so you have these kind of overarching periods of time, right? You have from creation to the call of Abraham, and in between that there's the flood and all of that. Then you have the period of the patriarchs from Abraham all the way down to Jacob and the 12 tribes. In Egypt, the Exodus event, they're in the wilderness Entrance into Canaan through Joshua, the conquest of the land. Then you have the period of the judges, remember where every man did what was right in their own eyes. Uh, sounds very familiar to today. Then the monarchy begins after Saul. Remember David's really the one that the Lord had all, all along to be king. Then you have the, the monarchy. The civil war begins. The period of the kings goes all the way until the fall of the northern kingdom and then the fall of the southern kingdom through Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. Then you have the Babylonian exile, that 70-year period that's one of the most critical times in all of Jewish history. The Lord points back to that constantly. And so you have this Jewish exile time where they are taken off to Babylon. That's where Daniel, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah are all prophesying around that time and writing, obviously, the books that we have today. The restoration going back to Babylon, that's where Zechariah picks up. Okay, so when they come back from the exile and they try to build the temple in Ezra, they don't get very far. Nehemiah is, is rebuilding the wall to give them a defense to build the temple. And you have Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi are all what, what we would refer to as post-exile prophets. And then at the end of Malachi, there's a 430-year a period that a lot of scholars will call the silent years, because in their mind, the Bible doesn't cover anything from that, the close of Malachi to when Jesus steps foot on the earth, starting in the Gospels. And that's about a 430-year time period. But as I note on the timeline, Daniel 11, that whole chapter, prophesies that period with exact per precision. As uh, Alexander the Great died, he divided his kingdom to the four generals, and that whole chapter is the struggle for power by those four generals until Jesus shows up, Rome conquers Greece, Jesus shows up, and while Rome is ruling the world. So they really aren't silent at all. But what we are undertaking is this period between Israel returning from the exile, rebuilding the temple in Zechariah, Ezra, and Nehemiah, until the end of the exile or, or the post-exile age until Jesus shows up. So there's this period of time where the Lord raises up Zechariah. Now, Zechariah, it's widely considered the apocalypse of the Old Testament. So that word, it's amazing how culture has such a negative connotation with the word apocalypse, right? Every Hollywood movie out there uses that kind of theme to create some, some crazy movie where buildings are crashing and there's fire and brimstone coming down. Or you know, think about uh, San Andreas, right, with the rock in California. There's this huge earthquake and he's saving the world on a helicopter. And, you know, all these crazy movies, right? But it's amazing how the word apocalypse, or in the Greek it's apocalypsis, all it means is the unveiling of. 
And so when you get to Revelation, and in verse 1 in the book of Revelation, when it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which the Father gave unto him, all it means in that word, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, it's the unveiling or an uncovering of who Jesus is. That's all it means. So it, it's, yes, the unveiling of who he is in the book of Revelation has some crazy things that happen. And we, as the church age in Revelation 2 and 3, leave prior to that happening. But because Jesus, uh, before he goes to war, he's going to call his ambassadors home. And we could do a whole study on the rapture that we've done several times here. But, but in any case, it's the un- unveiling of. So that's why a lot of people will call Zechariah the apocalypse of the Old Testament. Because it's, it's almost a small preamble to the entire book of Revelation. So it's the unveiling of who is Jesus in the Old Testament. And it's amazing how there's so many things that, that tie into the book of Revelation from this book. So just keep that in mind. It's, it's so rich, it it's probably has the most to do about Jesus in the entire Old Testament, the book from cover to cover. It, it has amazing prophecies all about the Lord. The Lord is going to introduce Jesus, our Messiah, as the branch in Zechariah 3.8 in this book. And the Lord speaks of the stone with seven eyes, which is a really curious link to Revelation. That's in Zechariah uh, chapter 3 also. It's going to speak of his throne, Jesus the Nazarene. So there's a Joshua, we're going to find Joshua the high priest in Zechariah 3. Well, Joshua is an Old Testament name for Yeshua or Jesus. So when you see Joshua in the Old Testament, there's a lot of times that it has something to do with Jesus in the New Testament, which is really fascinating. He's going to ride in on the donkey in Zechariah 9.9, and we studied that and fulfilling that to the day. He's the shepherd. His betrayal for 30 pieces of silver is going to be detailed. Him being pierced, his return in power. He steps foot on the Mount of Olives, destroys his enemies in Armageddon. All of that is covered in this little book. It's also going to focus in large part on the day of the Lord. So the return of Israel to the land, but still being in massive disbelief. And we're living through that right now. From May 14th of 1948, they've returned to the land in one day, but they do not believe that Jesus was their Messiah, in large part. There are Messianic Jews, but for the most part, they don't believe it. This book also contains the only physical description of the Antichrist. So in Zechariah 11, verse 17, the Lord refers to him as, his, as the idol shepherd, I-D-O-L, as in idol, like an idol that's set up to be worshipped. The Lord calls him the idol shepherd, and he's going to talk about how his right eye and hand are clean dried up, where he takes some type of head wound, and we studied that in Revelation in a lot of detail, but he takes some type of head wound, and there's a false resurrection in Revelation, where he rises again after that deadly head wound, apparently, and the whole world wonders after the beast be, who's, who, whose head wound was healed, and people begin to think, well, who's going to make war with this guy if he can just rise from the dead? And you can almost hear the sarcasm when the Lord writes that because there is one that will make war with him and conquer him, and his name's Jesus at the end in Revelation 19. Uh, the wicked system, the Babylonian system, is detailed in Zechariah, and it's going to give us a clue on how that system went from Babylon in Iraq, from Nimrod, all the way through history. It followed the papacy and the money and going to Europe where it settled in Rome, and then how it gets back to Iraq, modern-day Iraq right now, to be rebuilt. And so it's a mystery Babylon in Revelation, the key to the link between it, this false religious system, in a physical, literal city of Babylon that is rebuilt so clearly outlined in Jeremiah 50 and 51, Revelation 17 and 18, and Isaiah 13 and 14. It's so clearly laid out. This book answers that question of how it gets back to Iraq to be rebuilt. So really interesting. And the book is going to go through a lot of things going on in the Middle East that are happening right now. Uh, So Zechariah was a prophet. He was a post-exile prophet. He was actually born in Babylon during the captivity, during that 70-year period. 
Now, if you haven't studied the, why God took the children of Israel to Babylon for 70 years, it's pretty simple. They were supposed to till the land six years and let it rest the seventh, and they didn't do that for 490 years. They disobeyed God. And so if you divide 490 um, by 70, you get the, or by seven, you get the 70, 70 times they didn't do it. They're supposed to let it rest for a year. And God basically tells them, well, you owe me 70 years because you didn't do this. You didn't obey my word. And there were some other reasons, but that's one of the main ones. They just totally ignored God for 490 years. So Nebuchadnezzar is an instrument of God, comes wipe them, wipes them off the map in Jerusalem and takes them back to Babylon where they're held captive. Daniel, if you remember, was one of the young princes in Israel that was taken by Nebuchadnezzar. He's promoted within Babylon to be one of the, the main rulers in the world, the prime minister of Babylon. Very good friends with Nebuchadnezzar. Ezekiel is taken captive in the second siege where he, he is living in the south of Babylon along, along the river Chebar where he gets all of his prophecies and writings. Well, Zechariah is actually born in the captivity. So he's born in Babylon during that time. He was of the tribe of Levi, so thus he was a prophet and a priest. So he was a contemporary of Haggai, the prophet. Zerubbabel was the governor of Israel when they come back to rebuild the temple. So if you remember in Ezra, they're trying to do that. And then they have Joshua, the high priest. So it's not the Joshua that led them into Canaan. It's, it's a different Joshua, the high priest. And you can find that in Ezra 5, 1 through 2, Zechariah 3, 1, 4, 6, and 6, verse 11. So he's got, there's kind of this, this group of people that are the leaders of Israel that time. Zerubbabel, the governor, Joshua, the high priest, Zechariah and Haggai, the prophets, all going back trying to rebuild the temple, and Nehemiah is rebuilding the wall during that time. So you've got this, this group of people. Uh, if you remember when Cyrus and Persia captured Babylon, Cyrus not only sends the Israelites back to their homeland, but he gives them these financial incentives to go do it. Remember, he wants to fund the rebuilding of the temple. Well, at that time, there's only about 50,000 of them that take him up on the offer. So of the however many hundreds, maybe a million, hundreds of thousands, or maybe a million people, Israelites, that are living in Babylon, a very small group takes Cyrus up on his offer to go back to their homeland and rebuild the temple. Now, Cyrus is prophesied by name about 150 years before he's even born. In Isaiah 44, 28, this is the Lord speaking of Cyrus, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. See, Isaiah's prophesying of the Lord through Isaiah is prophesying of Cyrus saying, you shall go and rebuild Jerusalem and lay the foundation again of the temple. And that's exactly what Cyrus does when he comes in and conquers Babylon under the cover of night. He rescues the Jews, gives them financial incentives to return. In Isaiah 45 verse 1, the Lord says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two levied gates, and the gates shall not be shut. So there again, the Lord is prophesying of Cyrus as a shepherd, as his anointed man that he's going to use to help the Jews. So if you remember, uh, you can find this in some Jewish writings, but when he conquers Babylon, it's likely Daniel that gives him a scroll of the book of Isaiah and points to him by name in that scroll where the Lord has a mission for him. And so as a result, Cyrus offers the incentives and makes it his mission to go and rebuild the temple through the Jews. And as I said, a very small group of people actually take him up on it. Uh, Zechariah's name means whom Yahweh remembers. Now you're going to find all over the Bible that he's the son of Berkiah, but he's also the son of Edu. Well, the son of Berkiah, Berkiah means Yahweh blesses, and Berkiah was the son of Edu, which means the appointed time. So when you put Zechariah's grandfather, his father, and him together, their names going in descending order mean at the appointed time Yahweh blesses whom Yahweh remembers. And so you can find these, these crazy genealogies and their names, they all have meaning 
all over the Bible, and, you, and it actually shows up the most whenever the Lord lists out the 12 tribes of Israel. So you can go track that down. Uh, Genesis 5, we looked at that in here a few times, but how from Adam to Noah, God lays out the entire gospel through the names of those people, that man is appointed moral sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that by his death, he shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. And that's all in those 10 names in Genesis 5. But when you see that Zechariah was the son of Edu, that's in Ezra 5 verse 1, the Hebrews did not have a name for grandson. So like I'm the, I was the grandson of Lester uh, Shipman in Lawton, Oklahoma. There's no name in the Jewish culture for grandsons. They use son a lot. So don't let that confuse you a lot throughout the Bible. But Jesus actually speaks of how Zechariah died in Matthew 23 verse 35 that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berchiah, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. And Jesus is telling the Jews, hey, ever since Abel, when Cain killed Abel, remember what Jesus walks through and talks to Cain and says, the blood of your brother cries to me from the ground, what has happened? From that blood all the way, the way to Zechariah, who you killed between the temple and the altar, that blood is going to be upon you. And now that's a a crazy declaration by the Lord, not one that you really want to hear. But there's a lot of ancient Jewish writings that state that that actually happened, that Zechariah, the son of Edu, was slain in the sanctuary, and that he was both a prophet and a priest. Now in Nehemiah 12.4, it indicates that Edu was one of the heads of a priestly family, so the book of Zechariah was written approximately in 520 BC, about 60, you know, roughly 66 years after Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem in 586. And that date's really important to Israel throughout their history. But Israel was then taken captive all those years for 70 years. And as I mentioned, during the exile, Daniel receives the prophecies of the five Gentile kingdoms, going from Nebuchadnezzar all the way to the Antichrist kingdom. When he interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel then has a a confirmation dream of them being the terrible beasts or the beasts coming out of the earth and the sea. So you have Nebuchadnezzar, you have Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and Rome in two phases with the legs. And that's the kingdom that is yet future still, the Antichrist kingdom. Um, And the Lord confirms that throughout the book of Daniel. But Jesus in Luke 21 refers to that period of time as the time of the Gentiles, uh, where the Gentiles will rule over the Jews all the way until Jesus comes back and sets up the kingdom. Okay, Persia conquers Babylon about 539 BC. That's when Cyrus decreed the Jews could go return to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. And as mentioned, only a small number actually take him up on it. Uh, the Levitical sacrifices were reinstated in Ezra 3 when they rebuilt this, this altar. In the second year of their return, the foundation for the temple was laid in Ezra 3, 8 and 5, 16, but the building stopped. So they basically, they laid the foundation for the temple and they were so spiritually immature, they just stopped building. They, they backed off because they were getting too many threats from the surrounding nations. Uh, Nehemiah was trying to protect them by building the wall they, and they basically ran scared, and they stopped for 16 years in building a temple until King Darius of Persia started it back up again. So just to give you a, a flavor for that, Persia starts it, Cyrus starts it, it stops for 16 years, and then King Darius picks up the mission again. And that's where Zechariah pops up, the Lord raises him up to deliver a message to God's people. Okay, in the second year of Darius, God raised up Haggai basically to encourage the Jews to press on and rebuild the temple. And you can find that in Ezra 5, 1, verse 2 through 2, and Haggai 1, 1. Haggai delivered four messages from the Lord spanning about four months, and then he disappears. Two months after Haggai delivered his first message, Zechariah begins. So you can find this in Haggai 1, 1 versus Zechariah 1, 1. In Haggai, it says, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month. Well, Zechariah, it's in the eighth month, in the second year of Darius. And so, same year, just two months apart. So Haggai delivers these messages to encourage the people to press on in rebuilding the temple. 
Zechariah then delivers a message that we're about to study to encourage the people to a spiritual revival. So a little bit of a different message from God to his people. Okay, the Lord's going to deliver this message through Zechariah, calling his people to a renewal of repentance and spiritual maturity. He's trying to take them higher to not back down from what the world is, is laying before them. Now, you could, you could carry that through a lot of application for us today in terms of a spiritual renewal of repentance, of getting back into the word of God, to pressing on and not letting whatever the world is putting before us keep us from the mission that God has for you and I. So God has such a critical message and a, a call on our lives. We've got to press on in his word and carry that out. Now, the Lord dates a lot of these messages in Zechariah. And when you study God's word, you'll quickly learn that dates are never insignificant. God always has them there for a reason. So through this message from the Lord, the people are encouraged to complete the building of the temple in 515 BC, and that's in Ezra 6 verse 15. The dated portions of Zechariah's prophecy fall within the period of rebuilding the temple, and it goes from August 29th in 520 BC, that's Haggai's first sermon, all the way through March 12th of 515 BC. So it's about this, you know, think of it roughly as like a five or four and a half year period that a lot of these messages between Haggai and Zechariah are dated. Now, a lot of people say Zechariah had eight visions. Some people say they cataloged them as 10. Um, it, I don't, it doesn't matter that much, but whether you classify them as eight or 10, how you break it out, they all occurred in one night. So, and here's that list of how they were broken down. It starts in chapter one, verse six, seven, through chapter six, verse 15. So there's 10 or 8, depending on how you want to classify them. But here's, here are they, they're listed out for you. Riders under the myrtle tree. Now that one's very interesting when we touch on that one next week. The rider on a red horse. And so that you will immediately get linked to Revelation 6 when the lamb is loosing the seals and the, and the colored horsemen go forth. White, red, black, and green or pale horse. The four horns in chapter 1, 18 and 19, the four, the four blacksmiths or smiths, iron workers in chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. The man with the measuring lines, chapter 2. Joshua and Satan in chapter 3, that's where the seven-sided stone shows up, and it links to Jesus the Nazarene, which is really interesting. There's the branch in chapter 3, starting verse 8 through 10. The lampstand with the two olive trees in chapter 4. The flying roll, the woman in the ephah in chapter 5 verses 5 through 11, and then the four chariots in 6. So after the, all those visions, the Lord then spends a couple of chapters on the feast days. Then chapters 9 and 11 are the first arrival of Christ, and the rest of the book is then the second arrival of Christ. So very, very fascinating outline of the book of Zechariah. So Zechariah is going to open with a, a prerequisite, and that's why we're just going to take the first six verses today. But he's opening with a prerequisite provided by God to take part in God's promises. Now, a lot of the promises from God to the Jews were unconditional. A lot of them. Like, think about Abraham and the land. God, every time he speaks of it, God says, I have given you this, even before they've ever stepped foot on it. So in God's mind, they have the land. It is their land. Now, unfortunately, because of their idolatry and unrepentance, they got exiled for a season, that 70 years in the, into Babylon. Then they had the diaspora because they rejected Jesus the first time he showed up on the earth, where they were scattered for the better part of 1900 years until May 14th of 1948. But they will get that land as sure as you and I are sitting here breathing because God promised it. And... That, that promise gets fulfilled likely after Jesus steps foot back on the earth and sets up the millennial reign. Then they will have it permanently. But they'll start to get some after the Psalms 83 war as well. But that, the prerequisite of repentance applies just as much to you and I today as Christians. And what I want to remind us all of is that God has a standard. And when you get to know him and you get saved, you are justified 
you will never lose your salvation. The, the penalty of sin has been paid in full by Jesus and nobody else, and it can never be taken away. That's why he tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. You've got to be born again, and you cannot be unborn once you're born. As much as I would want to, I can't go back and, and cancel out that I'm the son of Carrie and Richard. So you are born the son of God forever. And then Jesus confirms all of that in John 10, where he says, no man can pluck you out of my hand or my father's hand. Okay, but what can happen is you start in the sanctification process, and the enemy, Satan knows he cannot take your salvation. So what does he want to do? He wants to make you unproductive for the kingdom, ineffective. He wants to get you distracted. He wants to get you tied up in things of the world. He wants, he wants you to walk around in chains of bondage where you can only take four steps and no further because that chain is latched on the wall and that's as far as you can go. Satan wants to make you ineffective. That's all he's trying to do right now to you. And his war is against the word, as we've mentioned a lot of times. You and I are just stuck in the middle here. So the standard for God, though, once you get saved, it's not perfection. It's not that you have to be sinless and living this sin-free life that you never do anything wrong. It's the standard for God is the pursuit of that. So think about Solomon and David. You know, you and I, after we get saved, we are going to sin at some point in our lives. But look at the difference. Solomon was never repentant. He, he didn't care. God told him, do not multiply three things, chariots, gold, and women. And he did all three in abundance, you know, to the tune of, of hundreds and hundreds of wives and gold, maybe the wealthiest man to ever live, even by today's standards, and chariots and horsemen. And God said, don't do that. And then you see the pride in Solomon's life step in, and he just, he goes the other way. And he's never repentant for it which is why Jesus in the New Testament says, hey, take a look at the lilies of the field. They're arrayed in more glory than Solomon ever was. And so the lilies of the field, what did they do to array themselves in glory? Nothing. They're just created. They're spoken. But David, here's a guy that he's anointed king. There's more spoken good about him, only second to Jesus in the entire Bible. And what did he do? He committed adultery, murdered her husband to cover it up. He took a census trying to put his strength in the armies of, of his armies, not in the strength of what God had for him. He messes up constantly, and there's nothing ever bad said about him. All God says constantly is, that's a man after my own heart. And the difference was David every single time was repentant. He turned to God. He would mess up and he would turn to God, cry for forgiveness, clean up his life, and move on to what God has him called to do. Now, as we know from the New Testament, that's obviously not a license to sin, right? Um, as Paul and the Holy Spirit through Paul makes that whole argument of, can we sin so that grace can abound? Heaven forbid. That's not what you're to do. But the pursuit of perfection, once you are saved, is the key. And to do that, you have to be in the word of God because like a refiner's fire, he's going to shed and burn away everything in your life that is an impurity. If you are truly humbling yourself before God and getting into the word, that word is going to wash over you and constantly be wiping things out of your life. Almost like a tide coming in and taking it back out. And then you don't ever see it again. You know, it's amazing, you can stand on the ocean and watch one seashell and the tide comes in once, and you can see it kind of on the water go back, and it's just gone, and you have no idea where it is. It's kind of that concept of washing with the water of the word from Ephesians. But what blessings do you have that the Lord's waiting for in your life? You know, if you think about that, Zechariah is calling them, the, the people of God, to a spiritual renewal so that they can live out the blessings that God has for his people. You and I, have more authority than you ever can imagine because the Holy Spirit indwells you. If you're in this room and you're saved, anywhere you walk, you have the authority because the living God dwells inside of you and you walk in that place and you have the authority by the living God, the Spirit of God that brewed over the waters in Genesis 1-2 and put all of the universe back together again. 
you know, he, he fearfully and wonderfully made you for a purpose. And the greatest journey you can go on in your life is to find out what that purpose and that call is. But what Satan will try to do is to get into your life, make you ineffective, try to hijack your identity in Christ, and call you that, tell you that you are someone else. You are not who God delivered. You are, you're that old person that was chained in this or that. He'll try to point you back constantly to where you came from, where you were delivered from. And, if he, and when he hijacks your identity and he gets you constantly looking at the past, then he will rob you of your call, right? The anointing you have on your life and where God wants to take you. And because you'll be ineffective, you'll constantly be bogged down in, I'm not worthy to do this, look at what I've done. Oh my goodness, when Jesus says, you are set free by the word of God and the prison door is opened, walk out and walk in freedom. That's what the Lord has for you. And that's what Zechariah is calling God's people to. And so you've got to, whatever is going on in your life, you have to go and get in full repentance and surrender to God. That's the key. And then you will, you will forever be set free. Okay, so to start out, Zechariah, we're just going to cover six verses here. Uh, they're pretty short. But in Zechariah 1.1, 1, 1, In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berkiah, the son of Edu, so the grandson of Edu, the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Boy, what a way to start out a message. You know, hey, I know the Lord sent me here, and I'll just tell you, God is very angry with everything that your ancestors have done. You know, that, that's, uh, that's not a very encouraging way to start out the message, but that's what the Lord has for them. And remember, Haggai's purpose was to encourage the people to finish building the temple. Zechariah's task is to petition them for a complete spiritual revival amongst the nation of Israel as it's returned. So the Lord was not only displeased with their ancestors, but he was sore displeased. And in the Hebrew, when you dig into it, actually means he was angry with anger. And he was, he was livid, as you can imagine. So here is God. He has this people set apart for his purpose. He wanted them to rule the earth, and he was going to rule it with them and show the entire world how to worship Yahweh, how to worship the true living God, not the pagan gods that they all worshiped. And their history is a, just an abysmal failure, constantly. It is constantly turning on God. But a history of grand deliverance littered with apathy and often just flat-out rejection of, of Jesus and Yahweh. But note that God is dating this prophetic book around a Gentile king, so that's significant. Uh, oftentimes, God dates things that he writes to a Jewish king. Very rarely does he date it to a Gentile king. And part of the purpose is, if you look at all the prophecies of the son of David sitting on the throne in Jerusalem forever, he's telling them the times of the Gentiles is not up yet. Okay, in verse 2, as I mentioned, it's angry with anger. Now, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, now all these things happen unto them for ensembles or examples And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. You know, when you study Israel's history, they are written, Jesus is telling us in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, the Holy Spirit's telling us that these things happened unto them, the Jews, for you and I to have examples of how not to live, not to live a life of rebellion, not to live a life of turning on God, not belittling his promises, but walking in the full authority of Jesus that you have and living a life surrendered and sanctified to him. Because upon you and I, the ends of the world are come. And we, we are barreling towards the time in the Bible that there's more written about after the church age closes than any other time in the period of, in period of history. There's more written about that time. And we're right now living in Revelation 3, the church of Laodicea, in that church age of lukewarm where we think we are in rich and in need of nothing. And Jesus says, but you are blind and naked and desperate and you need to turn back to me. And 
That's a, that's a great message for us today, that we've got to keep our eyes on him. So he's going to give the Jews three lessons from their past. There's disobedience in verse 4, delaying in verse 5, and doubt in verse 6. And he's giving them these lessons that they shouldn't repeat them. That's what he's, he's telling the Jewish people, do not repeat these. Therefore say unto them, thus saith the Lord of hosts, turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. So three times God calls himself the Lord of hosts. When you dig into that word too in the Hebrew, remember Jesus says this in Joshua 5, when Joshua sees him with his sword drawn and he says, hey, are you for us or for our enemies? And Jesus says, nay, but as the captain of the Lord's hosts, I have come. Take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And Joshua takes his shoes off because he remembers what the Lord spoke to Moses from the burning bush of it being holy ground, and he does so. But Jesus is the captain of the Lord's host. So the Lord of hosts, it it's means literally the armies of the universe, the armies of heaven that surround God's throne day and night. Now this message, though, should, should ring familiar in your ears if you've ever studied James, the book of James. Remember, so what he's saying here, thus saith the Lord of hosts, turn ye unto me, and I will turn unto you. In Zechariah 1, 3, look what G- James 4, verse 8 says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. So same thing. But who has the onus first? You know, think about the prodigal son. When he forsook his father, he blew his inheritance, he went and lived this life of squalor, and he realizes finally, what am I doing? I could be a servant in my, in my dad's house and live better than this. Remember, he was eating the slop with the pigs. And what happens? He had to turn back to come to the father first. He's turning and he's walking back. And the king, the father, is sitting there constantly looking. Where's my son? Where is he? I'm waiting. I know he's going to turn back. You know that Jesus is doing that very thing for you and I right now? And as soon as his son turned the corner, what happened? The father ran out to meet him where he was, arrayed him in royal apparel, put the signet ring on his finger, which in those days, in ancient times, that's a ring of authority. And then he had a huge feast for him. And remember the other sons get kind of jealous, but that's a key to us. He never lost his sonship, that prodigal son. He blew his inheritance, his place in the kingdom, but he never lost that he was a son of the Most High, the son of the Father. It's actually the only place in the Bible that you see a type of the Father in a hurry. You know, everywhere Jesus and and the Lord, they're just always taking their time. Always. Remember when Lazarus died and Jesus comes, he's been dead for four days, and they're like, man, if you were here, he would have never died. And Jesus is going, hey, chill out. He's not dead. He's just sleeping. I'll do, I've got this. You know, don't worry about it. And he calls Lazarus forth, forth, obviously. Well, here, God is in a hurry. And God is in a hurry for you to turn back and start walking back to him. That's what he wants. But the onus is on you first. Draw nigh to God. And Zechariah 1.3 says the same thing. Turn unto me and I will turn unto you. So you have a responsibility in that. God is a gentleman. He is never going to force himself on anyone, ever. Okay, in verse four here, be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings, but they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord God. So he's saying, as much as I delivered a message to your forefathers, constantly calling them, turn unto me, forsake the evil you're doing in your life, turn unto me. They never listened. They never listened, and I am pleading with you, children of Israel, do not do the same. Listen, listen to me, turn back to me. I mean, remember when Jesus showed up the first time, he told them, hey, if you would have believed, this wouldn't have been John the Baptist, this would have been Elijah, and we'd be ushering in the kingdom. And it's one of those crazy riddles in the Bible, but Jesus wanted them to just worship him nationally as his people. And he would have ushered in the kingdom right then. But they rejected him and instead wanted to kill the son of God. It's pretty wild. But their history is full of disobedience. They did not hear. Now, there's one thing 
when the Lord says here, think about all throughout the New Testament when the, when the Lord says, do not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. So they probably, remember what he tells Jeremiah, you're going to go and deliver this message and they'll, they'll hear you, but they don't really hear you. They don't do anything about it. And so it's kind of like your kids, right? How many of you ever struggle with your children going, you just feel like you're talking and talking and talking, and then they just do the exact same thing over and over and over and over. And you're, and you're sitting there going, do you ever listen? Do I, why am I breathing right now? Because I'm just, I'm just blowing hot air and it's not doing anything. Maybe an extreme case, but you can understand, you can relate a little bit with the Lord, right? In trying to parent and raise up a family and the children of Israel are just constantly going the other way. Okay, yeah, sounds great, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and, and Haggai and Zechariah and Micah and, and Obed and you know, all these prophets, and they just don't do anything. But remember what Jesus said today in Revelation to us as the church, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You, know, you and I have an obligation to not just hear what the Spirit is saying, but to be doers of the word of God to let it sink in. Now, how can you do that if you're not opening up your Bible? How can you be a hearer of the word if you're not in the word? You know, it's not, it is the only book that will set you free that is literally the God of the universe on paper. And it is a supernatural exercise, not a logical one. So it doesn't matter where you are in the Bible, just get into it. Okay, Zechariah 1.5, your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? You know, God's, I love when the Lord asks sarcastic questions to his people. Uh, One of my favorite sarcastic discourses in the whole Bible is at the end of Job, when the Lord comes to Job and asks him all these sarcastic questions of, you know, hey, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Where were you? Were you around? Did you see it? You know, where were you when I set the boundaries of the sea that it couldn't pass? You know, and, and all through that discourse, God refutes also um, global warming and, and waters raising up because as much as you want to look into that science, the sea never passes a boundary. Biblically, God set a bound and it doesn't pass. So he has these sarcastic questions, right? Uh, where, were, where are your fathers and the prophets? They're not around anymore. So if you think about this, you know, God implores us in Psalms to number our days Take reckoning of your days. You know, I I don't know how many years any of us in this room have left, but I promise you it's less than 100. That I I am absolutely sure none of us in here will live another 100 years. And so if you just think about that in the grand scheme of time, your life, as the Bible says, is but a vapor. And what are you living for? And God is saying, hey, all of your fathers that I spoke to, they're all buried in the ground now. And what good is their rebellion doing them now on the other side of this? The other side of this life, what good is all that rebellion doing them? Nothing. Nothing at all. You know, and just think about, it's kind of a challenge question. You know, think about how many weeks you have left, just on average. 52 weekends a year, uh, 40 years, what is that, 2000, 2,080 weekends? You know, if you've got 40 years left, just when you kind of think about it logically, It puts time in perspective that none of us should be wasting it. Okay, the last word word, or verse here in verse six. But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. So in other words, whatever the Lord has, has for you, He's going to fulfill that call, you know, purpose. Um, whether you're obedient to it or not, he'll just move on and find someone else. Remember what he says to um, Esther. Surely you've been called to the kingdom for a time such as this, but if you don't respond, you and your household will be ruined and I'll raise up somebody else in Esther 4.14. I'll just call somebody else because, but I want to do something radical through your life. And Esther was obedient And as a Jewish queen, she obviously rose up to be 
uh, one of the queens of the world, I should say, as a young Jewish maiden, she rose up to be one of the queens of the world in Persia. Pretty amazing. But the call for all of us in, in this as we're studying Zechariah is to take your call seriously and without hesitation. As I was studying, I, I read through the Bible once a year in chronological order, and I, I just started over um, not that long ago, but I'm, I was in Exodus 3, and God reminded me of this. Um, he really highlighted this for me. Remember when he calls Moses? And starting in verse 10, he says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. What does Moses say to God right away? Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Doubt, doubt, doubt. Right? Who am I? Who am I, God? Why are you calling me? Remember, if you study this even further, he goes, hey, I can't speak before Pharaoh. I need somebody else to speak. I'm, I'm horrible with words. I can't even put together a sentence, apparently. And God brings Aaron along. It's like, okay, well, I wanted to do this through you. I'm calling you to do this, but okay, here's Aaron. He'll come with you. Uh, let him speak. You know, God constantly is trying to pull Moses higher to a calling that he has for him. And Moses, you know, bless him, never enters it. He was going to take and deliver the children of Israel and bring in the promised land. He never even gets to step foot in it until the Mount of Transfiguration down the road when Jesus is here. But he, remember, he has to watch it and look at the promised land from a distance. And then God takes it upon himself to bury the body of Moses. He had such a strong call on his life that Satan wrestles with Michael over the body of Moses from the book of Jude. That's how strong his call was. And Moses never walked into it. So the Lord had to bury his body at the, mount, at the base of Mount Nebo. And it's the same spot where Elijah gets taken up in the whirlwind. And then you don't hear anything about the body of Moses until you get to the book of Jude. And you realize that Michael, the archangel, and Satan are wrestling over this guy's dead body. Now, if you, you could go down a deep rabbit trail as to why does Satan want the body of Moses? You know, it has to do with a lot of, of, lot of different things, but one of them is he's likely one of the two witnesses in Revelation that comes back. But you can hear Moses doubting God. And he said, certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this very mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Now, even when you go further in the story, Moses is constantly telling God what the children of Israel are going to say as a response to this. And it's amazing. It's almost like Moses knows in advance, Hey, I know what they're going to say. Why are you even having me do this? But this is where God says to Moses out of the burning bush, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And that's how you link that I am that I am. The burning bush, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. To Joshua 5, where Jesus take, says, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. All the way to fast forward to Jesus in the book of John, when he tells the children of Israel, before Abraham was, I am. And he's telling them, I am the voice out of the burning bush. And that's why they picked up stones to try to kill him. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt you say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. You know, Moses, um, Moses abandoned post because he didn't believe God. He got frustrated. He, he struck the rock twice. He wasn't supposed to. He seceded land as a result. He never got to go into it. And so you and I, you know, we have a call right now. And whatever call you have on your life, whatever anointing, God is going to give you a place to fulfill it. But if you don't do that, if you don't take that serious and walk into that, and the light retreats, Darkness always fills that vacuum. There's never a place where Christians get unevolved that darkness doesn't creep in. And, the, and Satan will come in and just take that land and he will try to work all kinds of iniquity 
and evil in that land. And so you and I right now, we've got to be involved uh, because Jesus is coming back to take us home in the rapture. And remember what he said in Revelation twenty two twelve, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his, as his work shall be. So you want to make sure that your work is abiding in the Lord, that you're serving him, you are stepping into your call, and you're not seceding land that the enemy will overtake. Because Jesus tells us all the time, I just listed a few of them here, but to be watchful. And so we're to be watchers, right, from, from Ezekiel and watchmen on the wall, that we see the signs of the times, like the sons of Issachar. Matthew 24, watch therefore, watch therefore. Mark 13, take ye heed, watch and pray, watch ye therefore. And then in Mark 13, 37, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. So the Lord is, is calling us to be watchful and to take this call serious, like Zechariah, come to a place of spiritual repentance and thriving in the kingdom. And on the other side of this, we have so much waiting for us in Jesus. And as I, I've loved to talk about all the time, there are all these rewards in the Bible the Lord has for you on the other side of this. So you've got to stay faithful. There's the crown of life, crown of righteousness, crown of glory, crown of perishable, crown of rejoicing. And those each are tied to something specific in the Bible that you do. And it's not an all-inclusive list. I think the Lord just puts those in there to give you a hint of what's on the other side. When you stand at the Bema seat from 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15, and Jesus says, well done, my good and faithful servant, come into the place of inheritance prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He wants to take you to a higher place, just like Moses, a place of service. And he has all these rewards to the overcomer in Revelation, to eat of the tree of life, not her the second death, hidden manna, a white stone with a new name on it. Jesus has a name for you that you don't even know yet. Power over the nations, the morning star, to be clothed in white raiment, a pillar with a new name in the temple of your God, to sit with Christ on his throne. I don't think any of us are doing that yet. Um, to inherit all things, the power over the nations, that'll be kind of fun at some point. Uh, but how are you an overcomer? You've got to remain loyal to God. You overcome trials and tribulations in your life while remaining faithful. Be spiritually zealous for the Lord. Do not deny Jesus. Do not defile your garments that he gives you. And keep the word of his patience. And all those are from the book of Revelation. Okay, so if you are here or if you're listening to this, at some point down the road and you are not saved, you know, what in the world are you waiting on? Um, this, this place is just spiraling out of control and there comes a point that Jesus is going to take us out of here once and for all to forever be with him and he wants to welcome you to your forever place. Getting saved, being born again, it is so simple. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's all you have to do. You cannot add anything to it. By adding anything to it, you are denying the finished work of Jesus on the cross. He either paid for it all or he didn't. So it's not Jesus on the cross plus things you have to do. It's Jesus on the cross once and for all Then he has a standard to live and he wants to refine you in your life and clean up things that have been weighing you down. So if you're here, if you're watching online, or if you found us on the podcast, anything, I, just, I am imploring you, get saved right now. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for this time together. God, we thank you that God, by your word, we can live. By your word is truth. It is the source of strength and might and power and authority. And Jesus, we thank you. We, we take authority over all the works of the enemy by your word. And Jesus, just as you said in Luke, by your strength and by your word, we have the power and authority to tread over all serpents and scorpions and adders to tread the enemy underfoot. And Jesus, right now, we pray that you would rebuke any attack from the enemy on the lives of the people that are a part of this church, that are finding us all over the world, that are listening to this 
down the road, we pray that you would rebuke the attacks of the enemy, just like in the book of Jude, Lord. The Lord rebuke you, as Michael said to Satan. And so, Jesus, we pray and ask the Lord rebuke you. And God, if there is anyone that is not saved or born again, we pray that you would set them free, that you would let them be born again in the Spirit, never again to be apart from you, but to have a a forever eternal ticket punched one way straight to heaven, to the throne room that you went to prepare a place for us, Lord, in John 14. And we thank you for that, Jesus. We pray that you'd be with all of us as we leave this place. And Lord, specifically, we lift up Linda to you. We pray that you would heal her bowels, that you would heal her stomach, that you would let her rise up and walk in strength yet again to return here with us in fellowship and as a blessing to all of us. And we thank you for their lives and and their family. And we pray that you would heal her right now. And Lord, breathe new strength and life into her. And we thank you so much for this time together. And as, our, as we continue the study next week in Zechariah chapter 1, starting in verse 7, Lord, we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You'll have a great week.